So this is probably my favorite location on Earth because it's likely the most mysterious. It's an aerial view of what is called Puma Punku, located near Lake Titicaca in the highlands of Bolivia, 13,000 feet above sea level. And academics cannot properly explain who built it, why and how it was built. So again, with an aerial view by drone, you see these very large blocks of stone. <clears throat> we have two types of stone located at Puma Punku. One is red sandstone, the quarry for which is located about eight miles away to the west. And then the gray stone is called andesite, and the quarry for it is about 55 miles to the northeast on top of a volcano. Now, academics insist, or at least most do, that all of this work was done by the Bronze Age Tiwanaku culture about 2,000 to 1,000 years ago. But again, emphasizing Bronze Age culture, the sandstone is relatively soft, but the andesite is very hard, and you cannot shape andesite with bronze tools. And there's no evidence that there were ever many bronze tools in this location. So here you can see where some of the excavation was done. They only dug down about two feet. And you can see all of the shattered stone. And I think what happened here was that there was a giant cataclysm that occurred about 12,000 years ago. And a tsunami from Lake Titicaca to the north simply swept out or swept up a lot of mud from Lake Titicaca and literally buried Puma Punku. So when the Tiwanaku civilization appeared about 2,000 years ago, they didn't even know that Puma Punku was there, but they did occupy Tiwanaku, which is right next door. The construction there is of larger stones, and so these were protruding from the mud, and they used this as their ceremonial center. And what you're looking at next to me are four of the famous H blocks on the right hand side of where I'm standing. And each one of those is of a different shape and size. So the idea that they were poured into molds is not correct. And the idea that they were made by the Tiwanaku culture is also not correct. <clears throat> so we're talking about a location super ancient and made originally using lost ancient high technology. Here we have the entrance to Puma Punku. Luckily they have a new, relatively new sign there. But 90% of the people who visit Tiwanaku and Puma Punku, which are in fact the same location, 90% never see Puma Punku because all they see are a pile of stones in the background. And they don't know what they're missing because it's very, very enigmatic. Here we see the basic design of it. Of course, it does look like a temple or pyramid of some kind, bilaterally symmetrical. There is a ceremonial pit of some kind in the center. And it's the most complex construction within hundreds of miles. It sits by itself. It seems that whoever built Puma Punku did so and built nothing else on Earth because the work that we see in the highlands of Peru are different. In the highlands of Peru, we find more polygonal construction. This is much more linear, and the surfaces are almost laser straight. This is a close-up of four of the H blocks. Again, we physically measured them, and some are more than an inch wider than the others. So each one had to be individually crafted there appear to have only ever been eight of them because much of Puma Punku was moved to other locations such as the little town of Tiwanaku in the background and used in wall construction starting most likely in colonial Spanish times but we see no evidence of any other H blocks <clears throat> and that's what makes them so mysterious. And here Again, we see the H blocks, and what's curious is the one that I'm standing behind 
was never completed because with the other ones all the surfaces are perfectly flat and perfect joinery but the one that I'm standing behind the upper niche and lower niche the corners are rounded so it appears two different types of high-tech uh, high-tech tool was used one for doing the basic shaping and then another one for doing the final flat surfaces and hopefully you can see that there with the one on the left hand side you can see there's a false door shape in the upper niche missing from the one on the right and the same thing occurs in the lower niche on the on the left there's a false door shape and no such shape on the right so the one on the left was completed the one on the right was never completed and that indicates that work suddenly stopped mysteriously we find the same phenomenon when we go to Egypt and also some of the other constructions in places like uh, the highlands of Peru you see major projects under construction and then suddenly a work stoppage and I believe this was all the result of an ancient cataclysm from 12,000 years ago there's abundant evidence that there was a global uh, cataclysm that occurred at that time and that corresponds to the rapid end of the last ice age so that's why people call constructions like this pre-diluvian as in pre-flood here we look at the backs of the uh, the ace blocks complex extrusions there's no evidence that these actually interlocked with anything else and the same thing with the ones on the front some people think that there is a interlocking mechanism that stones fitted into these slots to make a three-dimensional very tight fitting structure but if you want to call these the female stones there is no evidence of any male stones so this location is more complicated than most people can realize and again to some degree you can see that the stone on the right is at least slightly higher than the one on the left so there's no way that these were all made in a, in a mold as some people state but each one was I wouldn't say handcrafted but I would say individually crafted and the slots of the H blocks are not perfectly 90 degree angles they're actually more like a dovetail shape and that's why some people think that a dovetail would lock into it but if so where are the dovetails almost all of the stone that was removed from Pumapunku and Tiwanaku um, was regular rectangular blocks useful in the construction of houses and other buildings the H blocks are such a strange design that trying to find a place to integrate them into your construction would be difficult and fortunate for us that's why they were left behind and then here we see all sorts of different and strange indentations we see no actual artwork involved at Pumapunku just geometric shapes and geometric designs what we'll see at later or in later photos is we'll see Tiwanaku itself and there you will see artwork uh, surface carving and that was done by the Tiwanaku culture between 1000 and 2000 years ago they simply took advantage of the flat surfaces and decided to put artwork but whoever built Pumapunku they were simply pragmatic and here again these interesting cross shapes two levels of indentation some of them are heavily eroded and other ones are actually quite crisp if the surface of the stone was found upside down then you would have had almost perfect preservation and the other side exposed to the weather extreme erosion so some of them look like they're brand new whereas others look like they're incredibly old here two more of the H blocks they're not in their original location four of the other ones are over on the left hand side 
And again, they are the great puzzle. They weren't building blocks. Uh, they seem to be magnetic as well in nature. We've moved magnets back and forth across the fronts of the H-blocks and also into the recesses. And the compasses tend to go absolutely wild. I'm trying to figure out what the pattern is. And so that's why I've been here probably 55 times and will continue going a number of times a year in order to unlock the secret of how Puma Punku functioned and why is there this variable magnetism. This is a gate of some kind. There were in fact four, barely tall enough to allow a human to walk through. And then where you see the etch carving on the top, that was done by the Tiwanaku culture. Again, they found perfectly flat surfaces and decided to etch some of them with usually Birdman designs. <clears throat> and then here we have the excavation. And you can see that some of the ancient stones are protruding from the wall. So it's quite clear that a lot of the construction at Pumapunku is still underground, but the archaeologists refuse to do any more digging. They say, we've dug down two feet and that's all there is. But there has to be much more to it because ground penetrating radar has been done here by independent researchers and they have found that there are chambers underneath Puma Punku. But will they ever be excavated? We'll have to wait and see. And then these are where clamps used to be. So different shapes and sizes of clamps that would lock different stones together. There is my foot for reference in terms of size. Uh, the clamps that were found were made of bronze and it's very difficult to smelt bronze at 13,000 feet elevation, especially if you're a relatively crude culture. So it's possible that the bronze clasps were made by a much older civilization with the capability of melting bronze with ease. And these are more examples of, of these clamps and uh, what are actually called keystone cuts. So again, these were used to lock the stones together, whether that was for earthquake proofing or maybe for the movement of energy through the stone. Uh, since the stone is magnetic, it could be that, uh, and actually full of um, iron as well, and quartz crystal, it could be that energy moved through the stones in original construction and that the bronze clamps help to uh, facilitate the moving of the energy. And then these really interesting drill holes, perfectly evenly spaced, even in diameter. They had to have been done by some kind of power drill, but no such thing existed at the time of the Tiwanaku culture. And also, you would, it would take at least um, hardened steel to be able to penetrate the stone in this way. Also the grooves are perfectly flat and perfectly even as if done with a powered router. And other strange shapes like this. You have the circle which is more or less perfectly round but eroded and then the square notches are actually tapered. They're wider in the bottom than they are at the top, as if something was meant to lock into them. But unfortunately, Puma Punku has been pillaged over the course of a thousand years or more. In fact, when the Tiwanaku culture appeared 2,000 years ago, they immediately started to use the stones at Tiwanaku for reconstruction. So they moved a lot of the stones and built their own buildings. So there is absolutely no record or concept of what it originally looked like. But the foundations are perfectly level, within one degree. <clears throat> that takes some level of sophistication. In order to create a vertically le uh, level surface, all you need is something like a plumb bob. But in order to create a flat surface, uh, that requires some degree of technology. Of course, we have things like levels. But it's doubtful that the Tiwanaku culture had anything like that, not even what we call a bubble level um, or anything. So this is an indication 
that the foundations of Puma Punku were found in place and were utilized by the Tiwanaku people as foundation blocks to build stuff on top of. We also find that some of the red sandstone blocks have melted uh, surfaces, uh, that the surfaces were turned basically into glass, and that requires a minimum of 1,000 degrees Celsius, or possibly even 2,000 degrees Celsius, and that is much higher than a standard campfire or open flame. So could that be evidence of an ancient cataclysm, of uh, plasma from the sun striking locations like this, basically making them explode? Could be, that's what we're doing in terms of further research. And this is more of a close-up. You can see that the surface of the stone is in fact vitrified and glassy. We also have these giant foundation blocks, the largest of the sandstone ones. There's one that is estimated to weigh 131 tons. And again, the quarry is eight miles away, up and over that mountain range. So how were they moved when no indigenous trees grow in the area? You have nothing to use as rollers. You couldn't pull them, so how were they moved across the landscape? So this is a view of the large foundation blocks. The one directly behind is the one that weighs 131 tons. They do look like they, that they originally were interlocking and all lined up, but some of them have sunken into the ground. Uh, again, that could have been result of an ancient cataclysm liquefying the ground. And this is the profile of one of the giant blocks with these strange niches in it, function unknown. But again, perfectly flat surfaces and right angles, as if something was meant to lock in, but we can't find where the stones are that did that. And here, the uh, level shows the flatness of the surface, the fact that it, uh, this one at least, is still almost perfectly level. And if you didn't have the pitting as the result of all the weathering, these surfaces would be almost laser perfect, flat. That is not something you can achieve with hand tools. And this just shows you the flatness again of the surface. Clearly, this was machined. And more evidence of cataclysmic damage. Some of these stones partially sunken into the ground. It's likely that the entire original foundational platform extended for 30 to 40 feet, that these big sandstone blocks interlocked with one another. But again, some have been broken up and moved to build other buildings. They actually uh, dynamited the location uh, for the foundation of the uh, railway that was built nearby. So the sad case of Puma Punku is it's not in its original form in any way or shape. Then further afield, more than half a mile away, we find more bits and pieces of Puma Punku. So it could be that it's a much bigger site than the fencing which is presently around it. And then here again, the excavation going down two feet. Some of these blocks are in situ. And so, again, evidence that there was an ancient cataclysm that happened here that buried Puma Punku and when the Tiwanaku people found it, it was simply a hill. Also more possible charring of surfaces here on the Grey Andesite. Uh, again, possible evidence of solar plasma striking the surfaces. <clears throat> that is the theory of Dr. Robert Schock, who actually uh, accompanied, accompanied us once there. And then this is the original foundation at Puma Punku. You see there is no mortar in the construction. And so you have four layers of the original material. And then all of that clay was removed in order to expose it for the first time in possibly thousands of years. And then you see above it the original surface. So again, 
more evidence that Pumapunku was buried by some kind of ancient mud cataclysm. And here too, some of the foundation blocks located on the left-hand side. Uh, you see how it was originally found. That area on the left has not been excavated, and the whole hill has a very natural appearance. It's only where we find the um, excavations do we find these precision blocks that had to have been cut by some kind of machine. And there again, the foundation which has been exposed, perfectly level, and then on the upper part, that's the mud area that has not been excavated. And once again, the, <clears throat> the difference between uh, the, the areas that have not been excavated above and the areas that have been. You see two feet of more or more of mud on the bottom that covered up the foundation area, as much as four feet. And so this is a recent excavation from less than 10 years ago. So prior to this, the whole thing, this whole area looked like it was a nat natural hill. And this is a water channel located at Pumapunku. The stones still tightly fit together where you see my left and right hands. This was completely buried up until it was excavated. And where my forefingers are pointing, that is where the bronze clasps were found. The, uh, most of them have been removed and are located in the local museum. But again, trying to melt bronze at 13,000 feet by a relatively primitive culture would be very difficult to do. And this shows you the size of the water channel. Puma Punku is actually not very tall. It's possibly 30 feet high. So if it's a drainage channel for water, why does it have to be so big? And originally, there was a roof system over top of the channel where the stones locked into the side pieces. And there's a gently cupped area on the bottom which looks to me like it was machined out. So if it was for the movement of water, <clears throat> why is it on such a great scale? It could be that this was some kind of refinery uh, for metals, because there are a lot of metals found in the area, and that <clears throat> this was a way of pumping tons of water through the channel as a way to collect in pools and separate the metallic elements from the dirt and other debris, because the metals would tend to settle fast, especially gold, because gold is so heavy. Now we also find this ancient staircase made of megalithic blocks. And then in front, we see more recent repair with smaller stones. So the staircase leads to nowhere, but 12,000 years ago, the uh, level of Lake Titicaca was 100 feet higher than it is today. And so at that time, these would have been stairs leading down to Lake Titicaca. So that again gives us this time element of most probably 12,000 years ago <clears throat> as of either the destruction of, of Pumapunku or the time, either the time of destruction or the time of construction or both. But we do know the damage was likely 12,000 years ago, so the actual age would be older, but how much older is up to question. And just for a sense of scale, we have Antonio Portugal standing on the megalithic blocks here, again from a quarry eight miles away. We also find elongated skulls. Now the cranial volume of this elongated skull is larger than a normal human being probably 25% larger. So that is a genetic characteristic. And one of the other curiosities about Pumapunku, you have this element of the existence of early builders who don't appear to have been Homo sapiens sapiens. And that's just another one of the mysteries of this ancient place. Also, more evidence of there having been some cataclysmic event here with bones that have been shattered to pieces. This is not a simple cemetery, 
but it looks like a place where major devastation occurred. Maybe it wasn't 12,000 years ago, but it was all, almost 100% sure prior to the time of the Tiwanaku people. And now we're moving to Tiwanaku itself, and that is located right next to Pumapunku. Elevation 3,700 or 870 meters. So an uh, aerial view of uh, what is called the Kalasasaya complex. And unfortunately, it was rebuilt in the 1960s. And so that creates great confusion because it doesn't tell us exactly what it originally looked like. This is an interpretation of what it looked like. And another aerial view, and here again you see reconstruction of what is called the Akapana Pyramid, and it was a seven-level pyramidal structure, again partially reconstructed, but it also appears that it too was completely covered by an ancient wave of mud, was found by the Tiwanaku people, partially excavated, and then used as their central ceremonial site. And another aerial view of most of uh, Tiwanaku, the Kalasasaya complex on the left, and then what's called the Sunken Temple in the middle. There's probably a lot as well buried underground, but excavations are not frequent and not very extensive at Tiwanaku for unknown reasons. But here we have a model of what the Akapana Pyramid likely looked like in the foreground. You see seven levels with a chicana shaped pool in the middle and then the uh, Kalasasaya complex above and to the above right the sunken temple. And so here is Antonio Portugal showing you what the uh, Akapana likely looked like originally. Again, some theories are that it was a place for refining metals, that the, uh, the ore mixed with water was pumped on top, and then it went through a series of tight-fitting canals, and that that actually was what the function of the sunken temple was for, was as a collecting pool to collect the metals and silt and water and naturally, if this was done in a controlled nature, then the gold and other metals would settle to the bottom. Then you would pull the drain plugs, get rid of all the water, clean out the silt, and then collect the metals for refining. But that is simply one theory. And here we see excavations done in the 1960s. The original construction is here. Appearance of, of lots of water weathering for some strange reason. And this area was covered in six feet or more of mud, so more evidence that it was buried by an ancient cataclysm. And this is simply a, a close-up of it. A lot of the stone has been moved around. Uh, some of it has been pilfered by local people. But the foundation appears to be there, made of tight interlocking red sandstone blocks. And this, again, is the symbol that appears over and over again at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. It's like a false door with a double lintel. And we see that over and over again. It's the only major example of so-called art that we see from the pre-Tiwanaku period. And that, I think, is almost like a maker's mark of some kind. Very mysterious and likely not hand-carved, but machined into the surface. And once again at Tiwanaku, like at Pumapunku, we have this repeating design of this uh, false door with a double lintel and the surfaces of the stone almost perfectly flat. And again, magnetic anomalies, not with the red sandstone, but with the gray andesite. Some stones are more sensitive than others. The ones that are flat tend to not have too much of magnetic anomaly, but the ones which have the con complicated angles, uh, the magnetic anomalies go very wild. And so that's the main part of my research at Pumapunku 
and Tiwanaku now is the magnetic anomalies. And this is Patricia Awion, and she's touching a piece of stone that we had sampled or tested, and it's 37% copper. So that could be an example of an ingot that was created in the early times at Tiwanaku Pumapunku as the initial material for further processing. So once again, the idea that the original function of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku was some kind of metal refining place. And here is a close-up of what that stone is. Again, 37 to 38% pure copper, which is not normal. And another piece being held by Anthony. Again, this piece is very high in copper content. We only found about half a dozen of these on location. The rest may have literally just been taken away and been refined maybe even during colonial Spanish times, um, maybe even incorporated into the structures of local buildings in the town. And once again showing you the incredible flatness <clears throat> and once again these square shapes are wider at the bottom than they are at the top as if something was meant to lock inside. And these interesting semicircular shapes, they look like they were done by some kind of machine. Are these one half of a perfect circle? We've never been able to find the other half. So again, just an anomalous feature whose function we haven't been able to yet figure out. And we've also found foundation blocks, the original foundation at Tiwanaku. And as you can see, perfectly level on the horizontal. So these are still in situ from the first um, period of construction, many thousands of years ago. And what we do know is that there, there is a lot more underground at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, but whether that will ever be excavated is in doubt. And simply another example of foundation, almost perfectly level. And again, another very flat surface that you can see here. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of these precise blocks located at Tiwanaku. But again, unfortunately, Tiwanaku being occupied by the Tiwanaku culture, starting around 2,000 years ago, a lot of the smaller stones would have been moved and utilized in other constructions, as well as during the time of the Spanish conquest and uh, Spanish colonial period, and even up to the present day. The larger stones are in place because they were too big to move, and some of the foundation blocks are almost locked into the earth. And once again, this shows you that uh, we don't have perfect 90 degree angles. Uh, this is a Tiwanaku, but what we have are dovetail shapes. So much more complicated than creating um, a perfect 90 degree angle. Each side is exactly the same. And so it does look like something was meant to interlock in the stone, but we can't find the pieces that could have done that. And again, just another example of the flatness of the surface. Unfortunately, this wall was reconstructed in the 1960s and uh, they did not take record of where the different stones came from so we can never replicate what Tiwanaku looked like. But we do have some interesting data here. This was from about five uh, years ago. You see this massive stone block snapped in half. That's not natural. That would have happened by some kind of cataclysm, including the stones in the background, looked like they were thrown around. And then curiously, when we came back two years later, rather than excavating, the archeologists actually filled the area in. So they raised the, uh, the soil up by more than two feet. Was this a way to hide the ancient evidence? That is what I suspect. Not uncovering the past, but hiding the past. And here too, you see this giant stone slab that weighed 
probably 10 tons, very complex in its shape. And then we go back two years later and they've actually filled up higher so that you can't actually see the entire shape of what it originally looked like. <clears throat> and there is a photograph I took of excavations being done three years ago. And you can see they're uncovering quite giant stone blocks. Technically, I wasn't supposed to take pictures, but I wanted to take a record of the fact that there are large stones underneath Tiwanaku and Pumapunku that are being hid from the public. And here is another example of that. Not revealing the past, but concealing it. Also, this is off to the side, and this is almost a watertight shaft that goes down into the ground. I don't know why this hasn't been filled in, but this is likely from the very earliest high-tech phase of construction. All the stone fitting together almost perfectly, and so almost perfectly that this will fill up with water if it rains. And then we have these two stones again with these uh, cutting areas in the center. Here seen lying down about three years ago. And then suddenly two years ago, they're seen standing up. So they're still manipulating the stones and moving them around, destroying the actual historical record of this location. This was probably done for the public uh, to make it easier to look at them but it destroys the actual historical record. That's why it's important to keep going back to see how the uh, site changes over time. And here again, you see them standing upright. Uh, you don't see, actually we will see the detail here. The front surfaces are almost perfectly flat. And then the indentations the angles, or corners, are actually rounded over. So like at Pumapunku, this is where a tool went in and did the initial cutting out of the depression, or depressed area, and then another machine was to come and cut the corners, but work was interrupted for some reason. We also find these piles of ancient pieces of stone uh, that are simply put into areas in some kind of random fashion. The round one on the left-hand side was a grinding millstone that was being created during Spanish colonial times, and the others are parts of, um, of waterways, some Tiwanaku vintage, others older, but there's no pattern to how they're put together, and <clears throat> that just makes the situation confusing. And here, another pile of different stones, no idea where they originally came from, and there is the Spanish colonial millstone in the center. And this very strange shape, uh, you can see it's quite complex in design, and the most intriguing thing about it is that if you get up close to it, you see this very complex series of curves. You have sharp flat corn or sharp corners, very flat surfaces, and then this arch that goes in, it's a compound curve that would be very difficult to create in the first place. So what its original function is, was it part of a, a water movement system? That is presently, again, unknown and why Tiwanaku and Pumapunku are so mysterious. Then here we are at the sunken temple. Again, what its original function was and why it was made as a sunken temple is unknown. The only original features there are the vertical stones, most of, most of which are the andesite. The other ones were filled in in the 1960s, confusing the whole situation. And here, all of these stone heads. Some people think that they represent the different people from history from different parts of the world, but they're very poorly done. Uh, the most intriguing aspect are the headbands that seem to be on many of them, and that is not a standard feature of the cultures of the area. 
And then when we get to the weathering, again, this wall has been reconstructed and the vertical stone next to Susan here, you see the weathering pattern in the andesite is very strange. What we believe now is that part of Tiwanaku 12,000 years ago was actually underwater because if you raise the level of Lake Titicaca up by 100 feet, part of these structures would have been underwater. So does that mean it was constructed underwater? Were they actually almost like little islands? And then again here, the vertical stones are original. Some are up to 20 feet tall, andesite, weighing 40, 50, maybe even 100 tons. And then the smaller stones were put into place, uh, machine done in modern times in the 1960s or even later. And then we have this other massive staircase. Again, look at the weathering patterns on this vertical stone. It looks like waves have been washing up against it. Again, this could have been a ceremonial staircase down to Lake Titicaca 12,000 plus years ago. And that's just a close-up of it. Look at the weathering patterns. The fact that these stones in the staircases show incredible weathering and each one of them is several tons. In some cases, two stairs are one stone. They all used to interlock perfectly. And unfortunately, the area above, again, was reconstructed in the 1960s. But it probably looked like that. Then we also have these ancient water channels. Look at the grooves, especially here. You see almost the cupping of grooves. Those appear to me to be have done by a machine. And uh, I think this was recycled from the much older time period, original function unknown, but during the uh, Tiwanaku period, moved to, uh, or made to move water out of the center of the ceremonial complex <coughs> to the outside. And again, more grooves that appear to be machine made, perfectly spaced, uh, same width in between and a gentle cupping. Then finally, we are at the famous Sun Gate. Uh, it was originally one piece of stone, about 10 or 11 tons. The ancient crack in the right-hand side is from deep antiquity, and all the surface carving was done during the Tiwanaku period. There we see the back side. So on the front, almost no erosion. On the back, incredible amounts of erosion. So it looks like several thousand years ago, the cataclysm struck, knocked it face down, broke it into two pieces. It lay there for thousands of years, and then the Tiwanaku people found it, they erected it back up, and then they carved the etching on the surface of it. Here we have author David Hatcher Childress in front of a sculpture of what is called Viracocha, and what's curious about this, it's not very well made, but you can see that he has a full beard and mustache. And again, Andy and people in ancient times did not have beards or mustaches, and so it's quite possible that uh, other ancient races visited Tiwanaku, especially in the distant past before the time of the Tiwanaku people. And this is detail of one of the other gates. Compared to the others, this was made of a number of different pieces. Yeah, again, it was one of four. There may have been more. And again, the flat surfaces, the very simple geometric designs, and this repeating symbol of the false door over and over again. And this feature, which is called the Temple of the Moon, or the, actually the Gate of the Moon, that originally was one piece of stone, so it would have weighed probably seven tons. And once again, the quarry 55 miles, or about 80 kilometers away. And this giant chunk, again weighing probably 10 tons, it looks like it was thrown a great distance, and there it is lying in the ground. 
And so that's what makes um, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku so mysterious. There are no standard academics studying it to this very day. The only one that did significant work was a man called Arthur Poznanski, who spent 50 years studying the site. And he dated Pumapunku and Tiwanaku at 17,000 years based on uh, solar alignments, the precession of the equinox. So I'm not sure if standard archaeology will ever catch up to the more recent research that we're doing, but that's not really a problem, because if they don't do the work, then we will. <laughs>